those raw houses. Gone. All gone. If you turn up and the paramedics say, no, we want them out now, that means, like, don't mess about, don't try to be gentle, just get them out. It's like a fucking war zone. If anybody's got any ideas, now's the time to say, because I'm just about to call it. You know, when one of those trains goes through at that speed and hits somebody, you know, there's not much left of them at the end of it. Uh, I'll see how the disabled goes off without getting out. He's like, just inside. Steve, how are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Chris. Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for someone, having me on. Is someone trying to call you? No, it was just a thing popped up. Asking me to agree to being recorded. Ah, uh, got you, got you. And do you agree? It's, ne- it's not too late to back out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, if your phone goes in a podcast, just ignore it. Otherwise, we get cut off. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, mate, you um, you mailed me a while back. Um, yeah. London fi- firefighter, how many years, Steve? 20, 25. 25 years. 25, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and now uh, now a published author with two books out, mm. and from what we've chatted already, you got quite a good uh, grasp on life, or at least not acknowledgement that life's not always <laughs> what what we seem. No, no, indeed it's not. No, no, yeah. There's there's a lot there's a lot of things that are going on, but not just now. You know, for for a long time, but yeah, all is not what it seems. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's start with the training, mate. Can we? Because I think people yeah. will find that will find that fascinating. What? Yeah. How do you get into the London Fire Brigade? Well, I joined in 1993, and at the time, I think London's burning was at its height in popularity. Like you know, and every young man wanted to be a fireman. <laughs> and I turned up at Stratford Fire Station one day because they were handing out application forms. And when I turned up, there was a massive queue down the Rumford Road into the fire station to get an application form. And I'm standing in this queue and I'm thinking, I'm wasting my time here because I I think in that that intake, there was about 10,000 applicants and 200 jobs. Anyway, I was stuck with it. And in the queue, I'm listening to all this bullshit going on around me. There everyone's the bollocks and they've done this and done that. And uh, they will do the fire brigade a favour if they give them a job. Yes, (laughs) Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll sit on them. <clears throat> and um, stayed there queuing up, and the queue was getting shorter in front of me, and it was getting longer behind me. And I only had a certain amount of forms to give out. Anyway, I got to the table, there were two young girls there. And I'd heard before I went that if you make a mistake on your application form, a spelling mistake or a bit of crossing out or something, they just throw it straight in the bin, don't even look at it. So when I got to the front, I asked for two forms. And I got two forms, when I filled it in very carefully, sent it off, and then I didn't hear anything from me for a year. So I forgot about it, forgot about the fire brigade. And then out of the blue, I got a, um, a letter come through asking me to go for a written test. So you go for a written test, same thing, standing outside with a group of young fellas, all full of testosterone and bullshit. And you go in there, sit your written test, like maths, English, comprehension, dictation, that sort of stuff. And I thought it was quite easy. And I came out and I'm, all these blokes were in despair because they said it was so difficult, they couldn't do it. Uh, and that was that. So I went home and about a week later, I got another letter saying, can I go for a physical test? So I went for the physical test and that was at Southwark Training Centre, famous training centre that they've been using for, you know, since Victorian times. And it's steeped in history. And, you know, just walking through that arch into the training centre itself was just breathtaking. And you see all the other, you know, the squads that were already in doing their training. And I've done my fitness test and I've and I passed that. But I just loved the atmosphere when I was in the training centre. And then I went home again and then I got another letter to go for a, an interview. So it's got up to headquarters in Lambeth. Have an interview in front of a panel. Left that and then got another letter to go for my medical. And that's the last stage before you get in. And... So I went to the, I think it was a home office then, some medical place in London. Had my medical, that was all fine. 
And then the last thing is they send you to a different place. It was in Wimpole Street for an eye test. And I went, left the medical centre, went to Wimpole Street for my eye test, done that. And, and the bloke who did my eye test, when I'd finished, he shook me hand and said, well done. Have a long and happy career in the London Fire Brigade. And that was that, you know, and I couldn't believe it. That was it. I was in. And you said, and then I've got, go on. You said, who said that? Boom, boom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, I went home and I told all my family and everyone was happy and I was happy. And, and then uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a confirmation letter from the London Fire Brigade with a start date. And that was it. Turn up for training on, so I think it was about the 11th of November or something. And that was that. But um, yeah, what a feeling. What a feeling walking through that. Uh, um, the, the arch into the um, training um, area, like the drill yards and that, at Southwark. It's like an arch you have to walk through. There's an arch with two big black metal gates. And that arch itself is iconic because every firefighter, every fireman since Victorian times has walked through that arch to do their training. You know, and here I was walking through that arch in 1993. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to describe that, that sort of achievement, isn't it? Yeah, and so much going on, like, you know, there'll be other squads training and ladders being thrown up and water everywhere and shouting and hollering. It's very, it was very much like the military back then. Mm. Everything was like, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, Chris, you might do, being a Marine, but there's a lot of um, naval history in the London Fire Brigade. Ah. A lot of their terms and orders, bell signals and all the rest of it were taken from the Royal Navy. Because when they first started recruiting firemen properly, they took men from the Navy because they were used to the watch system. Mm. And like I say, you know, he, he, the uniform is like like a naval uniform, the cap, the salute. We, we do a naval, we used to do a naval salute rather than an army one, you know. And um, yeah, so it was all really good. I loved it. You know, we had to, we had to march everywhere. We were taught how to march, which was quite funny because none of us knew how to do it when we got there. And anywhere we went while we was in the training school, we had to either march or double. So what you do when you first start learning to march is to start marching as a squad, get all muddled up, start TikToking and all the rest of it, and end up running everywhere. <laughs> Were there many um, military applicants? There were, yeah, not as many as I thought there would be. Because when I was queuing up for my application form, it seemed like everybody in the queue had been in the military. Mm. So I thought it was going to be all military and I was going to be the odd one out. And uh, But no, there was, I would imagine about 20% of recruits there had, had served in the military. You yeah, know? so it, it, it's really popular in the Marines. Well, you know, it's quite, yeah. quite, quite a number leave and join the fire service and have yeah, uh, distinct, yeah. distinguished, distinguished careers. Yeah, mm. yeah. But no, the training was really good. I really enjoyed it. You go to Southwark for six months and do your basic training at Southwark, and I really enjoyed it. You know, it was hard, <sighs> but it was a good hard, if you know what I mean. Mm. A lot of people didn't like it. They didn't like the physical effort that you had to put in. They didn't like being beasted. We were beasted, you know, basically, which I don't think is a bad thing. Shouted at hollered out, no things thrown at you, you know, for making a mistake, but it's important stuff, you know, you can't afford to make mistakes when you get out there. So it was when, good, um, you know. Was... When I watched Blue Peter as a kid, pretty, mm. sure, pretty sure it's Blue Peter, one of the presenters went and they did some training with the London Fire Brigade and they mm. stra strapped him up by his ankles, lifted him up <laughs> on, a, on a crane <laughs> or on the extendable ladder and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. then they aimed the fire hose probably calling oh, yeah. it the wrong name here, but the, <laughs> yeah. they, and, and they just sprayed this guy upside down and he was spinning around. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. was, was, it, do they still do that? or is... No, they can't now. I mean, when I'd left training centre and went to my first watch, which was in Hackney in East London, North East London, and all that sort of stuff goes on there. When you go to the fire station, it's the new recruit, even though you've passed all your training and, you know, you go there and you're the new boy, you don't know anything. You know how to use all the equipment, but you don't know anything about firefighting. So what I do is you've come out of training school thinking you're, you know, the nuts because you know everything and you've passed all these exams and then you get to your fire station and they let you know that you don't know, you know, nothing. Yeah, and you get all that, you know, you get all the, I mean, I spent my first 
month, I think, like, saturated, constantly saturated. It's one of the didn't grow gills. Because, you know, you're getting buckets of water thrown over you for the slightest little reason. Yeah, so you get all that and the pranks. In my second book, I actually wrote a whole chapter on the pranks that get played on you, you know. Because it's a different world, you know. You go into a fire station and that, and fire station life, and it's a completely different world to anything you've ever known before. So when tell, someone tells you to do something, you tend not to question it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to ask before we chat about that, it, um, yeah. at what point did women become included in the fire service? Well, there were one or two. When I joined, there were one or two women that had got into the fire service. But then, you know, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here. Um, you can stop me if I am. But then certain government decided that they wanted um, targets. They said that they wanted to represent the population of London in the London Fire Brigade. So they wanted to recruit so many women, so many ethnic minorities, so many of this, so many of that. So that the Fire Brigade represented the population of London. Well, that's impossible. You can't, you know, you can't replicate the population of London because it's so diverse. But they did, they tried. And, um, and what happened, Chris, um, these people that they wanted to target weren't really interested in being firemen mm. and, and firewomen, whatever. So they were sort of, um, how can I say, they were coached. They were coached. They were taken to a training centre, told how to do the written tests in the application process, told how to do this, told how to do that, you know, given help with the fitness test. Um, and then when they applied, they were more or less guaranteed a job, whereas the likes of me and blokes like me had to really fight for it. Mm. The other thing as well that they did, their training, there was things in our training that we used to do that, you know, women couldn't do. I mean, let's face it, let's best be honest about it. You know, women are not built the same as men. They're just not. They're physically, you know, not, not all women. You know, I've worked with women that are really good bloody firefighters, but most women are not built like men and, uh, and whatever. So there's things in their training that they sort of dropped from training just so that more women could pass out. Yeah. Uh, just to sort of an aside, but I, I did the seamanship firefighting course. Yeah, um, it's pretty full on. You know, you do all the breathing apparatus stuff going yeah. in, going into the burning building, or or in our case, yeah. a, a burning ship. It was it was mm. fa absolutely fascinating. But mm. when I was on ship, and again, this come off the back of all this kind of equality, call it call it whatever we will. Yeah, my my ship was the first to have women on board. Right, and. Uh, don't get me wrong, they, they're a great bunch. We were, yeah. As we were a small detachment of Marines on, on this aircraft carrying, we, we all got on like a house on fire. It was, it was one happy, happy family. But yeah. I do remember thinking some of, the, some of our chief petty officers were, you know, they was getting on for like 20 stone. Bloody hell. And um, one of the techniques I'm sure you... <coughs> I'm preaching to the choir here, but obviously, obviously, if you need to get someone up a up a a, yeah. a ladder, yeah, uh, I've just called it the wrong name. Then, friends, mine nautical friends. What what's the name? What do we call a ladder in 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 the navy? But anyway, so picture a scenario where if you have one of these chiefs that was unconscious in smoke at the bottom of a a, a ladder, you you wrap the hose around them and you hauled them up the ladder well yeah. that's almost an impossibility for a fit yeah. young young marine to lift yeah. someone who's you know even 15 stone oh christ yeah um and some of the some of the girls on board were like the proverbial like eight stone mm. um so i did used to think how much of that is positive discrimination if you actually went to a war like the Falklands like Sir Galahad getting hit mm. you know mm. Coventry Sheffield Atlantic Conveyor etc oh, etc yeah. et it, yeah. it it you know I'm not, I'm not sure about that I'm not sure about the feasibility of it is is what I'm trying to say no no you're right yeah 100% right you know like I say it's just one of them things you know they're physically different to men there's um, you know some a few women can do it uh, a lot can't so what they did they catered for the women that couldn't 
because what was happening, there was women going through training school not being able to do the training. So technically, they shouldn't have passed out. Mm. But then what they did, they let them miss certain parts. I mean, we were tested every week, you know, and then you had your intermediate exams. If you didn't pass that, you were out. And then at the end of your six months, you did your final exams, like practical and, and written. And if you didn't pass that, you know, you'd get back squatted. Um, but a lot of the women, they were struggling. So what they used to do is to get, like, private coaching. They'd get some instructors, take them to one side to run through the thing they were struggling with. And then they'd come out and the instructors go, oh, yeah, they've done that. They passed that, you know. And then they'd go to the station and be totally useless. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I'm not being sexist. There was a lot of useless fire men out there as well. No, no, we got to have this conversation. You know, it, it's like Jordan Peterson said in that famous mm. in, interview where they, they yeah. the agenda was to hang him out to dry. And that just shows you there's yeah. an agenda there's an agenda. And he just said, Well, no, yeah. you know, there's there's some things that men are good at, and there's some things that our women are good at, and it's all yeah. right to acknowledge that. Yeah. I mean, you know, we had a Recruit uh, one of my stations turned up and they'd been targeted, you know, and um, they couldn't speak English. Mm. They could speak one of the two words of English. Like, how did that happen? How did he get in the London Fire Brigade when he can't even? And the first thing that's to do with him, once, and this was after his training, this was after he'd come to the station and none of us could understand him. So they sent him for English lessons. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, how did he get through training if he couldn't speak English? But that was. What they used to, and they admitted it, they said it's positive discrimination, right? And that's what they used to call it. They held their hands up and said, yeah, it's positive discrimination. And then it was found that they're not allowed to use the word discrimination, so they started to call it positive action. <laughs> it's the same thing, mm. you know. Yeah, we should, at, at the same time, give an acknowledgement, shouldn't we, to all the wonderful women firefighters out there that... that um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. we'll come and save my life if I'm <laughs> or my family. Um, oh, yeah, I mean so, I've worked with I've worked with a few female firefighters that have been better than a lot of the men. To mm -hmm. be fair, you know I'm not you know I'm not bullshitting you. I'm, you know it's the truth. Yeah, we had a, uh, one of the girls <coughs> on 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 ship, and uh, she was the first woman to pass the Royal Navy divers course. Yeah. And that, that might sound a bit, oh, it's just diving, but it's not. It's very, no. you know, you've got to be able to pick up all that kit, all the dry suits, all the cylinders, everything, get yeah. it on your back, and you have to run a quarter of oh, a mi yeah. mile under a certain time and everything. Mm. Um, what about, what what sort of tests do you do in your training? What's the kind of benchmark? Um, do you have to do the proverbial fireman's carry? Yeah. Yeah, we do. And, and on top of that, we had to do what they used to call a pick up and carry. <clears throat> and I used to get an ogle dummy, you know, which is like a crash test dummy, mm. and just dump it in the middle of a appliance bay or something, a big room, dress it in full fire gear. Now, because of the amount of water that was always being squirted around in training school, the thing was soaking wet. So they're full of sand, and then it's wet, and then it's got fire gear on, which is saturated through. And so I suppose altogether, it probably weighed about 14 stone. And you had to get it from a prone position in the middle of a floor, drag it to a wall, get it onto its knees, shove your shoulder into its stomach, get it into a fireman's carry and walk off with it. And then you had to put it down in a controlled manner. You, know, you couldn't just dump it on the floor. And you were marked on that. And if you didn't do that, you failed and you were gone. Um, if, it was just a, if it was just a dummy, though, I think I'd just leave it in the fire. <laughs> Yeah, it was good, to, you know, because as, as you know, you know, a, a person that's unconscious or dead, whatever, um, weighs twice as much as someone that's alive. Mm. Yeah, because <laughs> they're not really. cooperating with you at all. They're not giving you any help whatsoever. Mm. And the other thing we had to do was carry downs. We had to pitch, um, go to the third floor of the tower, which is like, the, yeah, the third floor, yeah, three stories high, and pitch the ladder, and then we'd get in side the tower onto the balcony and we used to have to pick someone up on the balcony into a fireman's carry and then get over the balcony onto the ladder with them over your shoulders and then bring them down the ladder and that was called a carry down but they don't do them anymore either because these were things that the women found it difficult to do to pick up and carry and carry down so the women found it difficult to do so they just stopped doing it so people who go to a fire station now 
will turn up and they don't really know if they're going to be able to carry someone down a ladder or not if it comes to it because they've never practised it. Mm. You know. I would just not go to any fires with any balconies. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Mate, well, well, um, getting into the nitty gritty then. Uh, yeah. God, you must have seen some sites over the years, yeah. some sites that I think, are, uh, you know, yeah. the majority of people wouldn't want to see. And yet you you guys and girls just charge on in there. Can yeah. you in, enlighten us a bit? Yeah. Um, basically, you've got fires, obviously, we went to. So we'd find people badly burnt or dead in fires and they are you know burnt sometimes if they've died through smoke and they don't look you know just look like they're asleep probably covered look, probably covered in sort of black and all the rest of it if they're badly burnt they can just have half a body burnt you can have a we had oh, one of them i had, remember from the waist down you know you can see the bones through his legs all the flesh is burnt away but the top half looks normal you know, and if you get someone that's been in the fire that's been bottled up for a long time, then they just sort of, you know, you know, like one of your sausages on a barbecue when you leave it on there too long, it's just all, all black and shriveled and, you know, that's what that's like. So that's your burnt stuff. And then you've got your car accidents. Usually at a car accident with people trapped and injured in cars that you've got to cut out, you're too busy to actually take too much notice of um, what's going on. The paramedics are dealing with it. Normally they're there before we arrive because they've turned up with the police at the car accident and decide whether they need the fire brigade or not. And then we, we come on, but yeah, I mean, I see some bad injuries. I see, you know, people dying cars, some stick in the mind more than others. There was one young lad and I've written about him, I think in the first book, he'd crashed his car and turned up. I mean, if the paramedics say to you, they've got to come out now, because normally you've got an hour, they call it a golden hour to get somebody out and stabilise before they go off to hospital. If you turn up and the paramedics say, no, we want them out now, that means, like, don't mess about, don't try to be gentle, just get them out, it's, it's urgent. And we turned up at this young lad and they wanted him out straight away. And, you know, he was trapped by metal as well as his injuries, so we just did what we could and got him out. And basically, they were sort of monitored him up and all the rest of it. And we stood there, he had a broken leg, broken femur, and I was getting in the job of like tugging on his leg while they put a brace on it because he was bleeding somewhere inside and I didn't know where and uh, just monitored him up and I just watched his life to step away from him like you know his blood pressure drops and his pulse drops and all the rest it just went but the HEMS turned up you know the HEMS helicopter doctors are absolutely fantastic they're amazing amazing people um, but over night time in London they don't fly the helicopters so they turn up in a fast car so they've turned up and they did what they could and, and, and I'm just about to load him onto the ambulance or take him away. And then this doctor, the Hems doctor, turned around to everybody, <laughs> including us. We're all standing now. And he said, if anybody's got any ideas, now's the time to say, because I'm just about to call it. He's just about to pronounce him dead. <laughs> Looking at each other, you know, didn't know. And then one of the other Hems doctors said, oh, what about so and so and so and so? So I said, OK, pulled him back out of the ambulance, set up a operating theatre on the side of the road, as they do. And I opened his chest up completely, um, clamped his ribs open. You know, I don't know how they normally do it that way or that way, I don't know. But it's... And then they had their hands in there and they're trying to find this bleed to try to stop this bleed that he had. And um, they couldn't do it. But what <laughs> the thing that got me, that surprised me, as they was... Because as, as they're doing this, they've got one of the paramedics pumping air into him with a bag. Mm. And as they're pumping air into him, every squeeze of the bag, his lungs was coming out of his chest, like two balloons, like inflating, coming out of his chest. Anyway, cut a long story short, um, he didn't make it. He did make it, he went. But that, that was one that sticks in my mind. Um, the, my worst incidents go to ones that I actually hated. If we got a shout, we went downstairs and looked at the teleprinter. And if I saw on the coal slip person under a train or person hit by a train I said oh no fuck's sake you know because did, that's what I didn't like I didn't like it was horrible nothing nice about that at all nothing enjoyable because when you get there there's nothing you can do you can't help anybody but you'd go turn up at the station and the trains if it's a tube train it's stopped in the station and they evacuate the train evacuate the station 
And as you're walking in, you've got all these passengers walking out and their white faces and, you know, so on, because they know what's happened. But then we have to go in now and walk all the way along the platform and look under the train with our torches to try and find where the person is. That wasn't pleasant. And then when you found where they are, then the job of getting them out. So that wasn't nice. But the worst ones for me was on one of my stations that we had a, um, a station where the Colchester to Liverpool Street trains used to go through without stopping, about 80 miles an hour. Just up the road from that there was a, a, like a mental hospital, a lot of uh, mental inpatients. And, and what used to happen sometimes, they'd discharge themselves from the hospital or escape, make their way down to the station and chuck themselves in front of the express trains. And my God, you know, when one of those trains goes through at that speed <laughs> and hits somebody, you know, there's not much left of them at the end of it. You know, they're just smashed hey, and what? scattered over. It's hell of a brave... I, I, brave isn't probably the right word because when you're that ill, you're not thinking about anything, are you? You just want to end it, but it, it's a yeah. frigging way to go. Oh, don't, yeah. I mean, if I, I don't think, well, I know, I know for a fact so I would never contemplate that. You know, I've had friends that have done it and you, afterwards you think, well, I don't understand why, you know, they were fine. But yeah, to do it in front of a train, God, that's got to hurt, hasn't it? Even for a little while. <laughs> I worked on a mental health ward once and uh he used to do a brief before he started work and they go down all the list of what they call patients mm. um and he got to this one chap and i'd been having a chat with him the other day and it, it some funny stuff had gone on and mm. you know he cl clearly one minute he was really well next minute his illness took hold and he was just what, what we call having a moment, but it was a, like a right. you know, psychotic episode. And yeah, so they got to this guy on the list and, um, and he'd sort of been scrubbed out. And I, I looked at the lead nurse. I said, Oh, where's, um, you know, where's John? She said, Oh, mm. John took the train. Wow. And I, I said, Oh, what gone to see his family. You know, I thought he got day release or something. They went, no, yeah, yeah. like he actually took the track. I'm like, oh, uh, God. Yeah. And it was actually the euphemism for clocking out was taking a train, right? But in this case, yeah. he actually had yeah. thrown, thrown yeah. himself under the train. Wow. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Affects a lot of people, I'm doesn't it? You know, affects. Yeah, I mean, I just can't imagine. To jump in front of the train, like I say, you know, I mean, it, sometimes it's on, it, on the tube, every tube station in London has got what they call a suicide pit. And under the tracks, it's like a concrete trench. So if someone hits the train, they'll fall under the tracks into the suicide pit. And when we turned up, that's invariably where they'd be. Sometimes they'd get tangled up in the axles and all the rest of it, but invariably they'd be in a suicide pit. And sometimes, you know, we turned up at a few and the people were still alive. You know, in a terrible state, but they're still alive. You know, they probably died a little while later, but yeah, it's nasty. Jeez. But we went to we used to we went to a few suicides, different ones. Um, that uh, one another one that sticks in my mind. We went, we got called to a bloke who was electrocuted, right? So we, we're on our way to this address, thinking he's had an accident. You know, he's been working on something and he's electrocuted himself. And as we pulled into the street, the Hems doctors had landed in a school playground, and they were running down the road with their backpacks on. Look like Ghostbusters when they're on their way to somewhere because they've got all this gear on their back. And they're running down there. It was a domestic house. And we went into this house and there was a woman in there and two kids and they're screaming and crying. And what it was, the, the father, he'd gone into his shed, got a, a kettle flex, you know, stripped the wires, wrapped them around his thumbs and just plugged it in and turned it on. And electrocuted himself in his own back garden with his wife and kids in the house. You know, I mean... Mate, we, you know, we were in a military, I call it a suicide epidemic, but, uh, mm. you know, it's been going on now for too long a time, over 10 years. Yeah. And, um, yeah. like, friends of mine have killed themselves and mm. they got mm. a, a partner and four four kids was my last my friend, friend. And yeah. it's just awful. It's yeah. just awful to get that, like, 
alienated from life and from connections and friends mm. to, to be in such a dark place yeah. that, that, that this can take place. It's like, we got a lot of understanding to do, you know, mm. we, I, I wish there was like a, you know, you got a bloody little card and when you felt like that, you could just go and check into somewhere and the next day mm. you wake up on a beach in Thailand mm. or something with someone yeah. giving you a massage, you know, yeah, yeah. nice drink That'd with an um, umbrella and, and, and just, just the intervention, you know, in that moment, that it, yeah. in, an intervention as opposed yeah. to what we've got is that you, you find out that your friend's killed himself. It's, yeah. it's, uh, I mean, my last, my last 12 months in the fire brigade, I had two friends of mine that I worked with, both killed themselves. And the thing was, they were both larger than life characters, you know, life and soul of the party, full of it, you know? And yes. then when you get called into the mess and told that, you know, they were found hanged in a wood last night, you know, you're thinking, what? <laughs> you can't get your head around it because you think, what? Didn't, he was like the life and soul of the party. He's just a loud, big character. Why didn't he say anything to anybody? Mm. But I had another friend and he attempted suicide and failed. He tried to do it with drinking <laughs> and tablets. But what happened was he waited till his missus was going to go out with her friends. And then he went into his back garden with his bottle of whiskey and his tablets, sat there and just wanted to do away with himself. Anyway, what happened? His missus <laughs> had, a, had an argument with her friends and came home early, found him. But I went to him afterwards. I said, what was going through your mind, Rich? You know, what, what happens? Does, does uh, uh, a steel shutter come down and you can't think of anything else? He said, no. He said, it becomes the most important thing in the world. He said, like, you know, if you know you've got to go to the bank tomorrow and pay some money in, or you've got to go and pay a bill, or you've got to go and do this. He said, it's the same thing. It's just a job that you've got to do. Yeah. He said, and that's all you focus on, doing this job. All these raw houses, gone, all gone. Up, mate. Cars, houses, houses. That was the first houses we got to when we was here. Look at this place. Fuck me. Whole little estates burnt down here. <clears throat> Unbelievable, wasn't it? It's like a fucking war zone. Ah, oh, uh, see, I had a disabled geezer. We had to get him out. He got out just in time. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Fucking, okay, it's proper still going round here. Yeah? Yeah. They just. This is unbelievable. <coughs> what do we reckon here? Just in here alone, I reckon. 20, 30 houses? Fucking hell. <coughs> Never seen nothing like this. Okay, you're on there still. Aye? Okay, you're on there still. Jesus Christ. Steve, were there any events of, um, you like prominent events that we that we might have seen in the media? Like the, there was the, all the London Bridge stuff wasn't there and um the the the, <clears throat> the tower block that that went up and this kind of yeah. stuff were you were you yeah. involved in incidents like these no oh <laughs> yeah well sort of no and sort of yes the only major incident that, that sort of everyone talked about and everyone still remembers was on 7-7 mm. like the bombings in london and i didn't go on the initial attendance because i was on me four days off we used to do two days, two nights, four off. And I was on me four off. But when we went back to work for our first day, 
we had to go to on a relief to um, Allgate East Station just to be there. And it was eerie because you go, you drive in, you know, and London was like a ghost town. You know, the normal hustle and bustle and people everywhere and noise, traffic, nothing now. It's completely shut down. And there was all sorts of police and MI5, I suspect, MI6 as well, was there going for everything. And they just started to bring the bodies out off the trains, but they had to document everything, photograph it, record where it was. And, and they were loading everything onto the refrigerated lorries. Well, we asked if we could go in there to have a look and they wouldn't let us in wouldn't even let us onto the platform because of cross-contamination and the, and the two officers that were given the task of getting the body parts off had blue boiler suits on and they weren't allowed to change their clothes even because mm. to change the clothes could have cross-contaminated evidence and all the rest of it you know but I remember saying to one of them when he come out to have a little break because they were so hot down there and I said, was it suicide bombers? Because everyone was saying it was suicide bombers and other people were denying it. No, it was. I said, were well, they suicide bombers? So I said, well, I don't know. He said, but let's put it this way. He said, there's not one body down there that's been smashed a bit more than any others. He said, so I suspect it wasn't. But then what they found out afterwards was that they had actually put their backpacks on the floor and what they'd done was just blew their legs off. So the rest of the body was still quite intact. Um, Greenfield Towers, I didn't go on. I know people that did go on it, and I know what went on there. Um, I asked to go on it. I had six months left to serve when that happened. And I kept thinking that we're going to go on a relief because it was way out of our area. But we, almost everyone in London went on a relief. Uh, we hadn't been sent on a relief. So on our second day, I phoned up our control. I said, look, you know, I've got six months to go. I said, Grenfell's the job of a lifetime, like, you know, any chance we could be sent on a relief? So she said, oh, okay, leave it with me. So I did. And then about an hour later, she phoned me back. She said, look, you can't go. She said, they're only sending senior officers there at the moment. She said, and you're a junior officer, so you can't, you can't go. And that was that, so I couldn't go. But yeah, I spoke to plenty of people that did go. Uh, it was just an incredible nightmare. I can't imagine what it was like. How we didn't lose... Um, firemen at that job I, I really don't know because they were told by the chief officer Danny Cotton forget all your procedures um, just do what you can do and they did you know they were they were um, using up the your breathing that rate is you've got a um, cylinder of compressed air on your back and it lasts a certain amount of time and the harder you work the quicker you use your air up obviously so they were going up the stairs in this tower block and then finding that they're getting to a certain height and they're really, really low on air. So I had to come back down again. And some of them ran out of air before they got back down and literally fell out the doors. So what they were told to do is take a spare cylinder in with them, which is a big no-no, because what you're doing is taking the bomb into a fire, really. It's a compressed air cylinder in, into a fire. Uh, and they were carrying, with the cylinder on their back, and they were carrying in spare cylinders, going up as high as they could before running out of air changing the cylinders and then going up further. You know, um, they just went way, way over and above. Um, I watched the inquest on that and it was infuriating. You know, there was a big inquest on it uh, uh, and I just criticised the fire brigade left, right and centre, mostly about this um, stay put policy. Our policy was always, if there's a fire in a flat, it's a self-contained concrete box, it ain't going anywhere. So someone on the same landing, as long as you keep your door shut, you're safe. And that was always the case. But with Grenfell, it went up the outside because of the cladding. It didn't spread like a normal fire. It wasn't a normal fire. It started off as a normal fire, just a flat job. And the flames licked out the window, as they do. And normally that would just lick up, like salt sculpt or stain the concrete or the bricks black. And that would be the end of it. The crew would go in and put it out. And that would be the end of it, over and done within five minutes. But because it licked out the windows and caught this clad in the light, it just went up like a candle. And um, Danny Cotton got sacked over it, um, bless her. So we had the first female chief fire officer. And at the inquest, when she was questioned about the stay put policy, should they have evacuated the block of flats? And she said, no, you know, if we had the same job tomorrow, oh, I wouldn't do anything different. And she was right. But because she said that in the public eye, she got the sack. You know, because you didn't say what was expected. And and to be fair, if someone had have attempted to evacuate the block of flats, there'd have been more fatalities at the end of the day. 
because people yeah. would have come out into thick smoke. They'd have been trampled on stairways and all the rest of it. You know, firefighters wouldn't have been able to get up for the amount of people coming down. Would have been a nightmare. But it sounds good, doesn't it? You know, oh, they were told to stay in there and they died in there. Well, that wasn't down to the fire brigade. That was down to the people who designed and built the cladding. Mm. But it might come out. I'll tell you what, it'd pay to be a base jumper in a situation like that, wouldn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> put yeah, your shoot, the shoot on and dive out the bloody pe- people did that after the events in uh, in New York and, and Washington pe- mm-hmm. people that were in high rises started to yeah. take in um, started mm. to take in parachutes yeah mm. you can't blame people for thinking like that you know, but that's the other thing they did as well after Greenfield because <laughs> somebody who hasn't got a clue Somebody who doesn't know but thinks it sounds like a good idea. And also, the politicians want to make it look like they're doing something to address it. So they wanted taller ladders. You know, the hydraulic platforms, right? Aerial ladder platforms, whatever you call them. Well, you know, what we had in London was good enough, really. And because of the streets of London being so narrow and these bloody machines being so big, they weren't practical. And if they got to the job, they probably nine times out of ten wouldn't be able to pitch because... um, Something's popped up on my screen. Can you see that? No. Okay, good. Is that your, your Russian wife? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Viagra. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, so they bought these bloody great big ladders like, so that can reach higher if there was another, you know. But at the end of the day, these things, like so somebody knows, wouldn't have, would have just said, no, what a waste of time. We ain't doing that. But because everyone's so scared now and, and senior officers in the fire brigade, you know, they're sort of more politician than they are officer. So when some politician says we want bigger ladders, yeah, okay, we'll get bigger ladders. Not thinking about how they're going to get through the streets of London and how long they take to set up. And even if they get set up and get pitched, how many windows can you pitch it to? You know, something like Grenfell, it wouldn't make no difference. Well, nothing would have made any difference at all. You know, that... That, that once that cladding caught fire, there was only going to be one outcome, and nothing could have prevented that. Mm. Nothing at all. No, you, Steve, you you touched on relationships. I'm 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 guessing there's yeah. a lot of hocus pocus goes on in the in the rank structures and stuff. Does it? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. What you mean with senior ranks? Yeah, I just mean. Not always the right people get promoted for the right job oh, today, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. sometimes yeah, you get no. people that are just really yeah. clu- clueless. And yeah, yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that was a lot. That was a lot, and a lot more often now than it used to. I mean, look back in the day, there was um, any senior officers that come through the ranks, served on stations as uh, station officers, and was well respected and liked by everybody. Knew their stuff. So when they became a senior rank, they still held that respect. And I still respected the lads because all the shenanigans and all the rest of it, they'd been up to it. They'd done it. They'd done all the stuff that you shouldn't do and all that. You know, they knew what the score was. And if you got into trouble, they'd sort it out for you. Mm. And then all of a sudden, the attitude changed and they started to try to turn. It's like, you know, the divide and conquer thing, you know, where you get um, animosity between the senior ranks and the station ranks. And people were just, chasing the next round of promotion and it changed people because they were all competing with each other who could be the nastiest bastard really who could screw someone and get brownie points from the person above them and all that like you know mm. and that's what it became like you know i worked with men as firemen at stations and they were great blokes you know really great blokes you know and they knew what the score was and they'd been up to all sorts the same as we all did and and then they get past a certain rank. And once they're off the fire station, it changes. And all of a sudden, you're not their mate anymore. You know, mm. their mates are all up headquarters. And they go and drink tea together and gossip in the mornings and all the rest of it and decide who they're going to hammer this time. Yeah, it could be nasty. Mm. Bullying, you know, um, talk about stress and all the rest of it. And most of my problems in the fire brigade were caused by corporate... <laughs> I don't know. I don't like to use the word corporate bullying, but it was, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I may. I, I, I think it's fair to say that you, you, you do get this in all professions and 
mm. when when you get subject when you're a square peg in in a round hole which mm. certain characters are always going to be that and it's no fault of their yeah. own it's that no. generally they're 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 too they're too good for the bloody job and they don't mm. possess to get on in modern society you kind of got to be a bit gutless you know you've yeah. got to yeah i mean yeah i've worked in offices where i got called into the boss's office mm. he reads me this riot act over something i said that was inappropriate or something i did or mm. and um he said yeah the 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 this person's not happy with and like he's talking about the person that sits opposite my desk that i chat to mm all day long and like yeah 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 i thought we had a bond i thought we you know mm. we 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 were mates and, and yeah when you go back and sit down at that desk this person goes all right and you're like mm. you two-faced so-and-so <laughs> how can you yeah. be like how can you oh, no. be like that but but it's it's normal to be in a profession. You, you've yeah. got to have the hell scared out of you and you've got to kowtow and toe the line. And it's yeah. why I, uh, it's why I was happy to go self-employed. Just yeah, absolutely. I just, well, that's why I struggle now. What are you doing now, Steve? Nothing. Mm. So I can't, I find it difficult, Chris, to work in an environment where you've got more of that. Uh, um, I can't imagine doing a job where I'm being told what to do by a um, 20 year old arse flicker, basically, who don't know anything and ain't got no life experience. I mean, I, I, I struggled in the fire brigade. <laughs> I remember uh, one time I was, my governor was off sick, so I was acting up in charge of the station. And we used to have various targets that they introduced fire safety targets and all this. And I went, well, I weren't into targets, I was into being a fireman, you know. And um, he called me in the office, this senior officer, one day. And he had a chart on his wall with all the targets on for the different watches. And he said, your targets are down. So I said, are they? So he said, yeah. He said, have a look at the list. So I said, no, I'm not going to look at it. He said, have a look at my list. Have a look at my chart. So I said, no, I don't want to look at it. So I said, well, you, you're, um, your targets. He said, you're not. Eating. So I said, listen, they're not my targets. They're your targets. Right? They're your targets. They're, you're the senior officer. They're your targets. If those targets aren't here, it's not my problem. It's yours. And that sort of thing. You know, he was furious. He really wanted to punch me, but obviously he couldn't. But that's the trouble, Chris. I mean, you know, people nowadays are afraid to say no. People are afraid to stand up for what's right and wrong. Mm. You know. Oh, mate, we've had, any amount. we've had two years of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it takes a very sorted person just to say, no, nah, ain't doing that bullshit. <laughs> Sorry, uh, what, what a crock. What a crock. Yeah. Yeah. What a crock. Um, but, um, no, it just, when you were saying that, it reminded me of, I did a, a college placement once, at a, a building here in the, in the city, and it was a young, mm. pe young people's organisation or something. And when I, when I started my placement and they, they did you the fire tour, which mm. all, all good, you know, introductions should include. Yeah. And it was all good. It was like, you know, here's this extinguisher. This is used for this. And here's the fire door. And here's the, and then mm. we got, to, it was a three story building uh, and, or a two story. I can't remember. And, but there was a top landing and this fairly youngish chap that's showing us around. And he, he pointed at the floor and he said, and this is the spot where you leave people in a wheelchair. Right. right. And I thought he's, I thought he was just, you know, saying it because he had to sort of say it or whatever. And I, I said, you are joking. It, if there's a, the building's on fire, you're going to wheel someone out and then you're just going to leave them here, right? And uh, he went, he looked at me in all earnest and went, oh, yeah, because yeah. if you hurt them, they could sue you, right? And yeah. it wasn't that, it was just the <clears> fact <throat> that he believed this bullshit you know mm, mm. i just thought as a you know as ex-military <laughs> there's no way you'd leave anyone in no, a burning no, no. building if you had the chance no. even if you had to drag them down the stairs um it was just it is it, funny the way life's 
life's gone, isn't yeah. it? Maybe it was oh, always yeah. like this, but it just seems to be really just yeah, it's brainless people get ahead. Oh, well, if we, if we had to drag somebody out of the fire, you know, you'd drag them by whatever you could get hold of, what might be their hair or their leg or something, and pull mm. them down the stairs. Like that. You know, you just get them out the best way you can. But Mark's they... talking about... Go on. Yeah, do they still have that trampoline thing? The the whatever you call it. Do you, do you remember that? No. Well, when people jump out of the window into this. Yeah, you had this big. It wasn't yeah. a trampoline. Like you didn't bounce on it. But yeah, it was like, like yeah, this, yeah, no, this no, huge, no. like plastic, like blanket, and the, yeah. the the you'd have it for jumpers. So yeah. people would pull this out, and then if they did jump, yeah. then then. But um, I thought it was quite normal for firefighters that say from like a three-story window where you yeah. break break your legs if you try to jump yeah. on this thing you you know you stood a chance you well you stood a very good chance of just yeah a bit like the old stuntman in hollywood you know when they land on these big crash mats yeah i thought that was a big thing yeah. when i was younger no probably in the films cartoons and stuff but um I've, I've seen photos of it being done at Suffolk Training Centre but that was like when there was still coal-strawn fire engines so they did do it at one time but no we didn't we didn't no we used to tell people if someone was hanging out of a window we'd say stay there we didn't want them jumping or trying to you know a picture ladder and get them out but so going back to jumpers we used to get a lot of people threatening to jump off of fire buildings and stuff and we'd be there for hours because when someone's threatening to jump, even though you know that they're not going to, the police have to send a negotiator up there to try to talk them down, and it takes forever. They get whatever they want. They get their packet of cigarettes and their Kentucky Fried Chicken while they're sitting on the roof or whatever. Um, yeah, and invariably, they don't jump. Oh, oh, the only one that ever jumped was already on the floor when we got there. So they meant it. And when, the, when the, it was in a... Um, like a department store, mm. car park on the roof, and someone went off of there. But when we spoke to the staff in the department store, they watched it on CCTV, and this fellow just got onto the roof, walked straight off and over, and that was it. He didn't stand there threatening and shouting like they do. You know, it's obviously just attention seeking. So if we turned up at someone threatening to jump, it was, you know, like, you know, there'd always be a big crowd standing there, which they loved because that's what they've done it for. But yeah, nightmare. What well, um, yeah. and what triggered your trauma then, Steve? Would you say because you've been through the mill a bit? How did it? Yeah. How um, did it start to manifest, and and where did it lead you? Two two things really. I mean, one was personal, something that happened in my personal life, which I've written about in the second book. Mm -hmm. When I lost a, a child, lost my son. And that, that had a major effect on me. And that sort of started the ball rolling, if you like. That's something that you have to live with and carry with you every day when you're going and doing your job and all the other stress that you have at work. It all compounds. But what done me the most damage, I think, we, had, we was in dispute once with management about shifts, I think. I can't really remember. And what they, the management decided to do, they was, um, people was with you. You know, you have the same in the military where people act up a rank to cover shortages and all the rest of it or the fire brigade runs on temporary promotion really so because we was in dispute a union said right everybody who's doing temporary bust yourselves and go back to your standard rank which we all did and then someone in management come up with the idea of this divide and conquer again so what they thought if we can split the troops and get them arguing with each other then you know that's a good way that we can beat them so what they did they picked on the leading fireman which i was or crew managers, they called them later. And they was giving us orders that we couldn't carry out. They was ordering us to do such stuff that illegal orders, really. Um, Can you give us an example? They would want us to go and be in charge. If, if there was a station down the road that was um, didn't have an officer in charge, they'd want us to send a fire engine from our station to go and cover their station um even though the people that they wanted to send weren't qualified to be in charge of a station that sort of stuff you know so technically it wasn't legal uh, the union had told us not to do it because we're in dispute but you know the reason for everyone busting themselves was you know because we're in dispute so what they did they started deducting our money 
they'd give us these orders that we couldn't carry out. And if you refused, they'd stop 20% of your wages, partial performance. And then they'd give you another order. And if you refused that, they'd stop another 20%, you know, and it was right on top of Christmas and all the rest of it. And it was just horrendous because they'd be phoning up sort of on a daily and nightly basis on, and giving you these orders. And you'd say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And then you'd find yourself 20% of your wages short. And some people, they, they lost up to 60% of their wages. And it went on for months. You know, and that had a big effect on me. Um, just because it was so stressful. You know, you go to work and you're just dreading the phone ringing because you know what it's going to be. It's going to be more bullying. So that got on top of me. And I, what made it worse was some of the people that was doing it that were sitting up the big house were people that I'd worked with and knew. Mm. You know, but they weren't singling me out. It was all, all leading firemen. But that, that was such a stressful time. In the end, I did go off sick with stress. Um, and then when I went sick with stress, it starts the ball rolling with the fire brigade. They've got a really good, what well, they used to have, a really good process. That uh, Once they got a certificate from your GP and it had stress or anxiety, depression on it, they would refer you straight to occupational health. And they'd, you know, they'd oh, monitor can, you. Can you hear that? That's thunder. No. Sorry, sorry, folks. That's thund thunder. Th thunder rolling in. Um, I think we're about to shatter the uh, the hot weather that we've been having. Sorry, Steve. No, that's all right. Yeah. So you refer to occupational health, and you get referrals to go to see them every month, so they can monitor you and see how you're going. And they give you the option of going to our welfare advice and counselling. I think it's called now, but it used to be welfare. And you can go there and speak to counsellors. And the fire brigade counsellors were excellent because they've had so much experience of dealing with people with trauma and all the rest of it, you know. And they were good. So I went to counselling. And once I started having counselling, it just opened the floodgates mm. and all this stuff started coming out, you know, and I just couldn't make sense of anything. And the, and the counsellor couldn't make sense of anything either. And, and every time she sort of got near this thing that was really deep down inside, that was, that was everything else was evolving around, I'd clam up because it was too painful. So she'd try to ask me and get it out of me and I'd go so far and then stop. And this went on, <laughs> you're supposed to have six weekly sessions of counselling and then that's your lot. Well, I was under this counsellor for like two years because every time I was, should have finished, she said, I don't think you're ready to finish. Like, you know, you need to carry on coming back. And so I did in two years. And then in, in the end, the fire brigade got a bit fed up with it because there were certain things that I was excused. Mm. I was still working but I was excused to certain things and the fire brigade didn't like it. So they sent me to see an independent psychologist, first of all, and he reported back to them and said, no, nothing wrong with the fella. Not that, you know, he's not taking the piss, you know? Mm. They weren't happy with that. So they sent me to, sent me to see an independent um, psychiatrist. And I thought, a psychiatrist, they're going to try and catch me out. I'm going to sit there and they're going to fire these loaded questions at me and try and catch me out. But it wasn't like that at all. It was just a chat, like I'm sitting there chatting to you. Uh, and that was it. At the end of it, he said, right, well, okay, let's see, you know, I'll, I'll write my report and send it off, blah, blah, blah. So I said, oh, I said I've got to ask you. I said, am I, am I mad? <laughs> he laughed. He said, no, not at all. Not at all. He said, you're, you know, what did he call me? He called me a well-rounded individual with well-developed so i forget what he said there anyway but he said no not at all he said you've got a problem he said um and it's got to be addressed and it's as simple as that he said and it's an easy thing to address so i don't see a problem so that was it off i went back to the fire brigade again so certain senior ranks still thought i was sort of taking a piss um and then my counsellor she said to me look what about this she said you, you go so far and then you won't go any further with the counselling and she said told me about emdr therapy which is eye movement desensitization reprogramming. She said they use it for like PTSD. She said, How do you feel about giving that a go? So I said, Yeah, yeah, I'll give it a go. So we started doing that. And she's sitting there and she's, you can't move your head. She moves her fingers. You've got to follow her fingers with your eyes. You can't turn your head. And she'll ask you questions and you'll give her your answer. And then she'll do this with her fingers again. And at first, I couldn't see the point because it wasn't doing anything. But then towards the end, her questions started to get a little bit more in-depth. 
a little bit more personal. And my answers started to upset me. And she kept, the last few weeks, she kept saying to me, like, we're going to have to finish this soon. How do you feel about that? So I said, yeah, fine. And then the session before last, she said, next next week's going to be our final session. You know, how do you feel about that? So I said, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, no problem. And I went up for my last session and, my God, she did her fingers movement and all the rest of it. And then she started asking me nitty gritty questions and taking me right back. She took me back to the delivery room when I lost my baby. Or my wife, no, I lost our, our, our son. And she wouldn't let me off. She wouldn't let me stop. And she kept probing and probing and probing. And in the end, I kid you not, Chris, in the end, it was like I was back there and I could hear the things that I heard at the time. I could smell the smells that I could smell at the time. I remembered every word that was said. I remember the doctor's faces and the midwife's faces. Remembered everything. It was just like being back there. And it totally destroyed me. It totally destroyed me. I was a mess. And I broke down in a big way, you know, a really big way. And then she carried on. And then she took me back to my happy place. Before you start the EMDR, she, she, they asked you to think of a place where you was, felt nice and calm and relaxed and safe. And that's your happy place. And that's where they always take you back to with their fingers after each session. And she took me back to my happy place. And she said, that's it, we're done. And... Yeah, I mean, it worked. It worked for me because mm. up until that point, I could never talk about it. I couldn't never talk about it because I'd get choked up and my eyes would well up and I'd have to walk away. After that, I mean, from then on, I've been able to talk about it. If people can want to ask me questions, I can give them the answers and I can talk, you know. It's just, it's taken a big, it's taken a load of pain away, if you like. I mean, the, the fire brigade you, stuff. You, go on. You'd, you'd recommend this? this therapy then yeah 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 mm. yeah oh well yeah it worked for me it worked for me mm. it worked for me it's a bit unusual you know when she first started doing it i thought well what the bloody hell is this all about you know but oh, it worked for me you know i definitely recommend it and, and, and apparently they do use it a lot for you know soldiers that are coming back from conflicts suffering ptsd and all that and, and, and the way it was explained to me was that if you've got something that's so traumatic that you can't deal with it at the time you just stuff it to a part of your brain where you don't have to deal with it. Mm. There's a part of your brain, apparently, where you stuff everything that you don't want to deal with. And what this EMDR does, by moving your eyes from side to side, it unlocks this part of your brain. This is how it's explained to me. And then it brings those memories and incidents back so that you can then think about them and, and deal with them. Mm. Uh, and that's what happened with me. But I suppose a lot of the soldiers in that, that have suffered while they've been you know, on ops, whatever. Um, some of it's so horrendous, a lot of it must be so horrendous that they just sort of tend to block it out. Uh, but then when you block it out, it's still there. It's still there. It doesn't go away. It still happened. Yeah. But it haunts people in different ways, you know, the nightmares and flashbacks and all that, you know, whereas but if you can get it back to the front of your mind, think about what happened and come to terms with it, I think that's, that's a big help. Mm. Yeah, I think in the military it, it can be a, often the case that um, people do experience some severely violent acts. But of course, you're working; you just got you got to yeah. compartmentalize it and, and move yeah. on. And exactly, I guess again, eventually that glass overflows. You know, you've got too much un, undealt with trauma. Yeah. Well, that's what it was with me, like you say. The glass overflows. I mean, my major thing in my life was to be, 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 be child but with carrying that with you all the time and then all the other stuff that happens at work not just the um conflicts with management and all the rest of it, not just that but other incidents as well that you wouldn't take any notice of ordinarily it's not pleasant but like you say you're at work mm. so you're busy you're doing something and it's for your job and that's it you just get on with it but it still sticks a lot of it still sticks. I mean, I can look back and I can probably remember. I can't remember them all because there's so many. But I can probably remember 70% of fatal incidents that I attended. Mm. You know, and I can remember, when I say I can remember them, I can remember, you know, where they were, what it looked like, what we did, you know, that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah. 
but you know, just get used to it. Just get used to seeing these things. Do you have any techniques, Steve, that you use now to, you know, to make sure things don't get on top of you again? Um, do you do yeah, like mindfulness, anything like this, <laughs> or stay away from the alcohol? It's no, no. I, I have, a, I have, a, I have, I enjoy a drink. I enjoy a few beers and a, and a bottle of wine, whatever. I'm still taking antidepressants. Mm. I've been on them for like over ten years now. Because I've, I've tried to stop taking them and it follows a pattern. You know, you stop taking them and then normally after about three months, you can feel yourself start slipping again. Well, you know. Hey, you need to, to, need to work on your toolkit. I can help you with that. Yeah. Because, um, well, yeah, you've uh, you got to be careful with meds. You know, nobody should do anything without consulting their doctor. But what no. I, I would say is is a couple of things. First off, don't forget, folks, just because it's a prescription doesn't mean it's not ultra strong chemicals that you're pouring mm. into your brain every single day and, and your body. Mm. But from the recovery perspective and develop a, developing the all important deeper connection with life, mm. you need to have a clear mind because your your body needs to be vibrating in rhythm in rhythm with life and it's why i hate hate taking painkillers and i've had to take them quite a lot in my my life well, i haven't had to but there were times i couldn't walk without them but why i don't like it mate is it completely dulls my sense of living. Yeah. It dulls my natural high that, that I get because ordinarily I'm quite sorted in life. You know, I think right, I eat right, I exercise right, mm. I don't want for anything. I like literally live in paradise. And that meds, they they put this barrier in there. No, no one ever talks about it. You're never going to get a GP Talk, saying what I'm saying to you now, you know, it, it's, it's, they're very good at writing out these prescriptions, but it's a temporary, it's a stopgap. Any medicine like that is a stopgap. It's to get you over a traumatic period in your life or a period where you can't sleep if it's sleeping pain or, you know, it's like anxiety medicine should only be prescribed for a very short time, you know, n no longer than a week or whatever. And then you, because then, it, you 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 can develop such a dependency on it. So, but with anything, the secret isn't just to stop. In my yeah. experience, is cut down gradually, really incrementally, so small that your body mm. doesn't really, until you get to the day where you're on this silly, ridiculous little, one and you're just like, ah, and you're there then. You know, mm. you might have a bit of psychological yeah. hang hangover because for the like sort of placebo effect, yeah. but it's um, you know, these measures are stopgap, mate. They they're stop. You know that. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you. You know, there is nothing wrong with you, mm. as a person, as a human being, or whatever. You just got to figure out a few more ounces. Is what I'm trying to say. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you know, I suppose what it does, it numbs everything, doesn't it? Or well, it takes the edge off of things. So yeah, your enjoyment as well is that the edge taken off of it. I get exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it very, very hard to get motivated to do anything these days. You know? Yeah, very, yeah, yeah. Very that and that's a that's a byproduct of, um, you know, li life can be like <laughs> that, Steve. You know, life can be demotivating, mm. and you've yeah. got to crack it. You've got to unlock. Mm the the energy i suppose you'd call the, the infuse it you've got to unlock it and there's a certain way you've got to do it but you've got to be prepared to you know look at what you eat look at what you think mm. look at your exercise routine and i'm not talking like arnold schwarzenegger or any shit like that i mean like if you everyone should walk around the block mm. at least you know 
yeah. in our family, yeah. all, all the adults do it, all two of us, <laughs> right? But, yeah. you know, yeah. walk around the block in the morning. I jog, I jog around. Sometimes I make it long, you know, I go a bit longer, but it's, it's really important. This gets, this reju, you know, re, replenishes your oxygen in in, 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 mm. in in your tissues and in your brain, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's really important to get off the stodgy Western toxic diet of just mm. carbs and meat, you know, and, and mm. move to a, not just a, a more plant-based diet, but, um, uh, you know, a diet that gets your body's pH back where it should be. You, oh, know, right. you think, you think of any plant, right? You never feed a plant on bloody Coca Cola and Big Macs and shit. You people would look at you like you're an idiot. But when it comes to the human body, all this has been hidden from us by the the food companies and the mm, big industry mm. and the and the big pharmaceutical. Yeah. They they don't want you to know you're a living organism. Some things yeah. are going to do you right. Some things are a big big no no. And um, yeah. it, it's a very you know this is what I this is all the stuff I enable people to understand when I'm life coaching. You know, some very simple basics. We do a five-day course in my, fa- in my Facebook group. Uh, we, uh, we call it Five Days Lost to Legend. At the end of that five days, it changes your life so much that people never go back. They never go back to the old way of, you know, we, we do five very simple things for five days. That's it. Right. Even as, yeah, even as silly as when you've had your shower in the morning, turn it on as cold as you can bear for as long as you can bear. You'll get it up to fully cold eventually. And then you can just sort of stand there like. <laughs> right. It's going to give you such a buzz for the day, especially right. if you've had your jog around the block. You know, it yeah. all goes back to our ancestry and the fact that it would have been normal for, for us to get cold and wet in history. You know, we didn't have houses. If we had a cave, if you were lucky, but a lot of the time we're just like the monkey. We just have to sit there, sit it out. And nature's mm-hmm. so clever, Steve, it incorporates this into our evolutionary design. So it uses that coldness to stim. In this case, it stimulates something called the vagus nerve. And that's your feel good like nerve you know it's the same with yeah. a dark diet you know um it's same with like fasting like like fasted i won't i won't bore you with the details now but it's natural in human evolution we wouldn't have had food at hand three times a day every single day it would be naive to think that we would have gone possibly weeks without food while we moved from you know this foraging ground to to a fresh one or we had bad weather or you know illness or whatever it might be and the body's so clever it uses that period of fasting to to clean yourself out right and to rejuvenate yourself and to get Mm -hmm. when you lose fat you lose a lot of uh, acid that the body builds up and um because the body will store acid in your fat it will store toxins in your fat etc 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 so yeah this is all Knowledge, I, I try to enlighten people too because you're not going to hear this from your GP, right? No. If I show those to my GP, she ain't got no clue what I'm going on about, right? Schooled in mm. Western medicine. Western medicine is you get your prescription pad out and, you know, you do it that way. And there's, there is, a t- like I said before, there is a time and a place for medication. As, mm. But it should always be stopgap measure. It shouldn't no one's that you know no one's a broken machine we just have challenges in life and and um i just try to enable people five simple things five days lost a legend at the end of that five days you know we got bob hello bob very very nice man down there in australia we did the five day we jogged around the block in the morning you can walk you can take the dog it doesn't matter if you're not into moving your legs you can go swimming or or psych what what doesn't matter right bob never stopped running he turned into forrest gump right (laughs) he's run every single day for 18 months now he's entering he's doing the old ultra marathons 
Right. And he love he just loves life so much now. He absolutely loves yeah. life so much now. And that sounds uh, good. I have to give that a go, Chris. That sounds, yeah, that sounds, stay, sounds really good. Yeah, stay tuned to my Facebook. Anybody yeah. out there? And it's yeah. a good old five days. And the the thing is with me, Steve, is I don't like difficult stuff. I like to do the easy stuff in life. So, yeah, so I, I. there's nothing on that five day course that anyone no. will fight. It's all stuff that you can do. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. I remember but, uh, maybe a year or two ago, I remember seeing something on uh, about this Wim Hof breathing and he was a little yeah. Royal Marine. I forget his name now, but he used to go and take a dip in his local rivers and that in the morning. Yeah, and, that uh, sounds yeah, like exactly. um, that sounds like Sam Murray, who's been on the podcast <laughs> before. Right. I'll tell you who else as well, um, and I think it might be where I first saw him, Stevie Burns. Steve, yeah. yeah. Uh, funny enough, Stevie Burns and another ex-Marine, um, Jim Cook. Do you know Jim Cook? I know Stevie. I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting Jim. Uh, two lovely, lovely fellas. And cut a long story short, about two and a half years ago, my daughter, when she was 21, was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. And as a result of that, in June, two years ago, she had to go into parts and she had half of her right lung removed. Mm. And this was during the lockdown. So I couldn't go to see her before she went into hospital. Um, I drove her to the hospital and had to drop her off in reception and then leave her there with them. Couldn't go and visit her or anything like that. And then I was coming back home um, and sitting there looking at four walls because I wasn't allowed to see anybody. You know, I don't live with a partner and I was just on my own going mad. And I put something on the Oxbarton um, Facebook page and uh, Stevie phoned me up and had a long chat with me. And then it was almost like he assigned Jim to look after me through this difficult time. And I was getting messages and everything off of Jim daily. And it was like having a guardian angel. And I'll tell you, you know, it just makes such a difference, such a difference. And I'll always appreciate what they did. And I'll never forget it. Never, never forget it because, you know, that's, that's nice genuine people. Yeah. Well, this is the thing in life. It's easy to forget that we're massively loved, Steve. You know, mm. there's people out there that you never met that love you more than anyone else in your life. Well, probably. I, I even, um, you know. I don't see that. The there you go. Up Spartan. Spartan. Yeah. yeah. I'll, put, it just I'll, made that me. I'll get Luke to put a link for Up Spartan below because, uh, mm. Good old organisation Steve started there. Yeah. Definitely. Brother, listen, let's finish. I, I've just realised I've got to take someone up to the hospital. So mm -hmm. uh, let's finish on something funny, lighthearted. What What was the funniest prank that that you saw pulled in all your time in the, in the service? Funniest prank? Um, oh, my God, so many. So many. Most of them, well... Going to this, this was funny. I'll, I'll, I'll just very quickly, right? I'll tell you about this and then I'll tell you a funny incident out of the fire brand. But one of the funniest things that when I went to my first station, it was right next door to a church. So when I first went there on the roll call, we're all dressed in their fire gear on roll call, and there was one fireman there with his undress uniform on. And I didn't know it's because he was going on an out duty, he was going to another station for a day, but they told me he was going to church. Said so everybody goes to church, we send someone to church every Sunday. And uh, I didn't know any different, you know. I thought, oh, yeah, it might be a superstitious thing or, you know, whatever. They said, next Sunday, it's your turn because you're the new boy. So I said, okay. So the next Sunday, I got me under a shooting for one. They sent me next door to the church. I've got in there and I was the only white person in there and I'm wearing a uniform, right? And it was a, one of them evangelical churches where the vicar's in a white suit and they're playing guitars and they're all just, oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> 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 so I stayed in there for an hour and then went back to the station and they were obviously all laughing and all the rest of it did you like it so I said yeah, it wasn't bad actually and they said they said at least you've only done an hour but they said trigger on the white box stayed for the whole four hours because <laughs> he enjoyed it so much <laughs> <laughs> brilliant brilliant Steve listen we're going to Go put um, we're going to put links for Steve's books below folks we'll put a link for Op Spartan um, I'm can't wait to read your book, mate, because I know, I just know it's going to be engaging. <laughs> and I like, I like to read good books. I'm fed up with reading 
bloody yeah they're easy, easy reads as well they're, they're not yeah. long books and they're easy reads yes and yeah. um uh come back and chat to us again mate uh, and uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll see you in my uh, my it's called Chris Frew the Legends Coach on Facebook. Right. I'll st- okay. Anybody out there, come and join us. You know, life's too yeah, short yeah, well. not not to be absolutely smashing it. You know, and get a yeah. nice bit of community. Meet just meet nice people. That's what life's all about. You know. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to come back. And, you know, because we've just sort of scratched the surface, really. Yeah. Steve, I've really got a fry, mate. So just stay on the yeah. line so I can thank you properly. But massive thank you again, brother, for coming on the show and for Thanks getting, for me, getting in. Yeah, you're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. To honor. everybody out there, um, please keep smiling. Remember, challenges are only temporary and you'll look back at them in days, months, weeks, years to come and go, oh my God, like, you know, can't believe how much my life has moved on. So Keep positive. Massive love to you all. If you can like and subscribe, that would be really kind. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.